Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman, and welcome to The Last Frame Live. Tonight, what is the number one skill that every successful photographer has it? And of course, how can you get it and master it? Also, I've got a real tiny little bit of industry news and some announcements, and of course, I promise to do a Q&A before we wrap up, and, and really this conversation is hopefully actually going to be kind of a big Q&A in and of itself. You'll see but I will do my best to answer those questions for you in the next 60 minutes. And of course, if you're watching the replay, I'll add the chapters below the description so that you can jump ahead to the sections that interest you the most. And if you're watching the replay, no worries, drop a comment below the video, let me know you were here. But for those of you live, do me a favor, you've already done it, a lot of you, leave me a note in the chat, let me know who you are, where you're watching from. Uh, I see Crystal's here from right down the road. Lynn in New York. Charlie L in North, uh, where is he? Central North Carolina, sorry. Sean in Connecticut. Uh, Jim in Denny'sville, Maine. Alan in Denmark. Gator in Southern, that's Lane in Southern Indiana. John in Indiana also. I got David out in the West Coast, San Diego. Uh, we got Marsha in Florida. I know Joe's here in California. Ron is here from tomorrow in Australia. Peter in England, uh, Angela just snuck in here from Spokane, Washington. All right, so first of all, thank you all for being here. Thank you for following, paying attention, engaging. I need your help tonight. I need you guys to help me along with some of these answers, okay? But all of you, you're part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who have been tuning in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I'm going to work really hard to help you with your photography. So look, you know the drill. I want to get into this. Do me a solid. Hit the thumbs up. Share the show. Let your photography friends know about it, okay? So I've mentioned this for the last couple weeks running. I'm just going to mention it again because next week I'm going to start going into a lot more detail. But three big events that I have coming up after the first of the year that you know, at least one of these three should be on your calendar, right? So the first one in January, Imaging USA. It's going to be in Nashville, Tennessee this year at the Gaylord Resort, which is like a city in and of itself. It's incredible. Uh, I'm going to be doing a pre-con class, actually two of them, the day before the event starts. That's going to be Saturday the 21st. And then on Sunday the 22nd, the whole show kicks off and I'll be doing a platform talk that morning. First thing bright and early, so bring your coffee. But looking the way it's lining up here in the photography industry in the United States, Imaging USA is the show and it's going to be the show. The others are, they're on shaky ground. Photo Plus, Create NYC, gone. WPPI seems to be having some struggles getting ready for next year. I really, really hope they pull it off, but not so sure that's going to happen. So that's the show you want to see. Also, I will be doing a week long class. Yeah, a full week. You think you can stand me that long? But you get to work with me for five straight days in studio and on location settings in April at the Texas School. Um, absolutely awesome program. It's one that I've been wanting to do for a very long time that I'm finally getting to participate in this year. So next week, I'm going to take you through a deep dive of Imaging USA, let you know what it's all about and why you should consider attending. And also, I'll even fill you in on how you can get there really, really cheap, okay? Uh, industry news, I've got two things I wanna share. Uh, the first one is I'm gonna take an opportunity to uh, gripe a little bit. Sorry, but I am. Um, you guys frequently hear me dish out some kind of negative statements about the photography blogs. And honestly, you know, I guess it's like, oh, that's really good. Joe forgot to silence the phone. It's kind of the same as what goes on in, in any news media at this point. You know, there's there's good reporting and then there's crap. There just is, right? And, and look, I'm not picking sides. We're not making this political, right? But in the photography industry, just like when I talk about manufacturers, we need to start holding these media outlets, as well as our manufacturers, we need to hold them accountable, right? Remember that as the photographers, as the people that go out and take the pictures every day, as the people that buy the gear, as the people that read these websites, because 
there is valuable information to be had, important information to be had. It's up to us to hold them accountable and let them know about the kind of crap that we don't want. So one of the things that I talk about frequently is how these websites, I don't know that it's intentionally, but I think inadvertently, they wind up fueling a lot of anxiety in the industry. And the kind of stuff that I'm talking about is this, and, and let me be clear. I personally know the owner of DIYphotography.net. I consider him a friend. He has been supportive of my career. That's not gonna stop me from voicing concerns about things that I think are just ridiculous because when they choose to post an article about something like this, all they're doing is hurting the industry. They're not helping because this is literally one of the most useless videos and articles that I've ever seen in the photography space. A headline, a somber prediction, AI will replace all creatives. Like, oh my God, Terminator, the robots are coming, the world is ending. You know what? Please buy my cameras before they're not worth anything. How ridiculously stupid is this? The fact of the matter is, AI is going to eliminate some jobs. Just like robots have, just like computers have. But AI is also bringing so much potential, so much creative potential to the photography world, to the creative world, as this particular YouTuber who they wrote this ridiculous article about talks about. It is bringing so much potential. So is AI gonna be able to automate a lot of things? Yes, and that's not bad. Gang, look, the world evolves. Don't, don't be the photographer, I don't care what age you are, but especially if you're in my age bracket, don't be that photographer that's like, oh yeah, life was so much better back then, you know? Come on, stop. We are so lucky with everything that we have, and this AI technology, you guys have heard me say it before. I'm not saying you gotta go dive into AI technology, but don't be an ostrich with your head in the sand and ignore it. It is hands down a big part of the near-term future in the photography industry. So do not ignore it. But is it gonna replace creatives? Is it gonna replace all creatives? No, it's not. This kind of stuff is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. So me for one, the guy that did this video, it is my opinion he's an idiot for doing this video because he offers no research, he offers no frame of legitimate reference other than, oh my God, AI could do this and imagine what it might be able to do in a few years. It's literally chicken little and the sky is falling. It's ridiculous crap. So that's it. That's my editorial piece for tonight, my opinion. Now, the next piece about the photography news for the week has to do with the fact that tomorrow in the United States is Thanksgiving. So for all of you who celebrate Thanksgiving, May you have a wonderful and relaxing and happy Thanksgiving, hopefully with family or friends. But the day after is Black Friday, which means this weekend is a terrible weekend if you're a person who suffers from gas. Gear acquisition syndrome, gas. In case you've never heard that before, don't think I'm being inappropriate. Be smart. Be careful, be realistic. Is it really gonna make a difference in your photography? Or are you buying something that's on sale because one, it's just cool and you wanna have it? Or two, because you think that just buying this piece of equipment is suddenly going to elevate your photography? Because understand that even if it's a piece of equipment, that allows you to do something that you haven't been able to do because of the lack of equipment, it's still not going to improve your photography unless you put in the time to really learn how to maximize its use. So that's the end of my PSA. You've been forewarned. There will be good deals over the next few days, probably over the next few weeks. I expect that this Christmas season in the photography industry, just like in the rest of retail, is going to be very, very competitive. With inflation being up, all the companies that provide us photographers with gear, 
you know, it hasn't been an amazing year for them and they're going to want to sell product. So I expect there's going to be really, really good sales between now and Christmas, but just be smart. Okay. All right. So let's get to our topic. And, and I'm hoping I asked a question, but I haven't seen anybody give me an answer. So I, I'm, I'm purposely not going to give you an answer until I get a few people to weigh in on this, right? So the topic of our show tonight is the number one skill, and you can, it, it, you can hold your answer for one minute, and I'll give you some framework if you're worried about typing in something that's going to sound stupid. Honestly, there's nothing stupid that you can type in. Um, the title is the number one skill that every successful photographer has. So what I'm referring to is I want you to think about whomever you feel is an incredibly successful photographer, someone who you look up to for the quality of their imagery, for the um, things that they have accomplished in their career, for the amount of money they make, okay? I want you to consider that photographer. And for that matter, you know what? They don't have to be well-known. They don't have to be iconic. They don't have to make a lot of money. It could be somebody that you know in a camera club, but this person consistently generates images that you look at and be like, my God, I wish I could do that. I want to be able to do that. All of these people that I've just described, they all have a skill set. Now, the reason I told you to hold off and I'll give you some framework, here's the tough part. That skill set has nothing to do with photography. So actually, Angela, you picked the most popular answer to this question, which is light. Angela said reading light. I had a few people on Facebook and in my talk knowledge community talk about uh, understanding and being able to see light. And yes, as photography goes, that is probably one of the most important uh, skill sets that a photographer has to develop. But you notice I said one of the most important. There's one that fits above it. And some of you are going to groan because you want it to be something juicy. It's not. Some of you are going to be like, oh, I've heard him say that a ton of times before. Okay. But I want to relate it. And I also am actually going to tie this back to our topic next week. So I saw somebody type it. One person has typed it so far. Peter Blythe from the UK for the win. Okay problem solving. Every successful photographer is excellent at problem solving. But let me break this down. And by the way, all of the other things that the rest of you said, uh, creativity, the ability to communicate ideas, feelings, and moments, discipline, uh, vision, desire to do better, mastering it, practice, connecting with the subject. Uh, John also added solving problems. John's in my mentoring group. You ought to know that one because I talk about it a lot. Um, all of you, you're, you're not, they're not bad things. In fact, they are very high on the list. You know, if we're going to go ahead and prioritize, every one of those is excellent and it's up there. But number one at the top of the list is problem solving. And let me explain why. It's actually a very, very simple concept. As photographers, you may have heard me use this analogy before. And I want you to notice, I am going to raise my hand first because I am guilty of what I am about to accuse you of. As photographers, we're not always that bright. Here's what we do. We go out. And we spend thousands of dollars on camera gear. Thousands. And from that moment forward, we're not content with a picture. Hello. We want it to be epic. We want it to be amazing. We want people to look at it and say, wow. Even if our skill set's not there yet, that's what we want. So what have we done? We've created a problem. Come on, think about it. You've all done this. You're driving down the road. Your camera's in the car. It's with you. And you see something. You're like, oh my God, that would be an amazing picture. Maybe it's an incredible sunrise or sunset, anything. 
and you reach for the camera, but then you stop yourself just as fast. And you make excuses. Uh, but I don't have the right lens with me. I'm not gonna be able to get close enough. Uh, the lighting's not that great. Uh, you know, it's a little bit too dark and I don't like pushing the ISO. And you come up with all these reasons not to take the picture, not to solve the problem. Because you're afraid the picture is not going to be epic. The most successful photographers are the ones that solve the problem. But now I'm going to add to that sentence. So think about whoever you had in your mind when I described, think of the photographer that you consider to be just incredibly successful. And again, this is not uniquely about business. This is just about taking pictures. That photographer is incredibly successful because they are excellent at solving problems in a unique and oftentimes unusual manner. Meaning they don't do the same shit that everybody else does. That's why they're successful. Now, you know, here's the challenge. Okay, Joe, that makes sense. Sounds easy, right? Well, if it's that easy, you'd all do it tomorrow, wouldn't you? So the other part of the title is, well, how do you master that? And that's the answer that most of you don't like. That is lots of practice. But I want to take it a couple steps further. The way that you actually master becoming good at problem solving is to actually want to be a problem solver. And then you begin the practice of problem solving, meaning you don't walk away from challenges. You take a crappy picture and you take the time to reflect afterwards when you have some downtime, you take the time to reflect on what you did, how you did it, why you did it. And then you work to figure out why didn't it work? What could I have done differently? I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm not going to name names. I did a consultation this afternoon with a photographer from Europe. This is a photographer that I consulted with, I believe, just about a year ago, the same time. Uh, and he had reached out to me for guidance on marketing, particularly. Um, this is a commercial advertising photographer. So this person has, uh, in fact, a year ago, let's start there. When he reached out to me a year ago, had uh, a really excellent portfolio um, of you know, commercial advertising images with lots of product shots, lots of even like liquids, you know, how you see the shots with like liquid pouring out of glasses and splashing and all that. Really excellent work, excellent, okay? And we talked about some goals and we talked about some things that he wanted to achieve. And we talked about some ways for him to start to do that. Uh, by his own admission, he is a little bit of an introvert and not really kind of a marketing guy, but he was very aware this was going to be a key need in his business. So here we are today, a year later, and he sent me uh, a lengthy email before we did the consultation, kind of bringing me up to speed on his year and where he, you know, where he's gotten in that year and the things that he's done. Um, and I pulled up his website and I literally almost fell out of my chair. Just in the course of a year, this guy's work went from like here off the charts. This guy has an incredible portfolio. And he definitely also had some successes on the business side, picking up some new clients, et cetera, but is still struggling with that. And now he's feeling a little bit more pressure because he also signed a lease on a larger studio, gorgeous studio. I'm kind of jealous of him. Um, so the advice that I wound up giving him was actually less about how to do more marketing than it was about his portfolio, because here's what I noticed. When I got done just being incredibly impressed with how much he had improved and expanded on his portfolio in a year, I realized that while these images were extremely high quality images, 
incredibly well done. You all know that I am extremely particular about details and I respect imagery that really has immaculate detail. These images are top notch. But there was one big problem. There was nothing in the portfolio that I haven't seen before. There was nothing that made this portfolio unique. It stood out for its quality, absolutely. But I'm a photographer, so I respect that quality. That's why I saw that. But beyond that, it didn't stand out as unique. And that's really where our conversation wound up focusing is we need to solve that problem before we can spend a whole lot of money on marketing and to, especially to big corporations and things like that, which is a challenge. It's a real problem, right? And so fortunately, as soon as I started talking about that, he started telling me about some personal projects that he'd been working on, some ideas that he had. It's like, there you go. You've got to dive into those. You've got to explore those more. And it's not about changing his style. His style is incredible. But it's about finding that hook, that thing that is going to grab someone's attention. So this brings me back actually to last week. We're still on tonight's topic, the number one skill. But I was very surprised last week. As you may recall, last week, my topic was, what is your least favorite part of being a photographer? Now, I had the expectation that I was going to get a lot of answers like, gear is really expensive. And boy, was I wrong. The way that folks, you folks, interpreted that question was not at all the way I interpreted the question. And so it doesn't make you wrong. It makes me wrong because I really did not understand how people would grasp that question. But here's how they grasp it. I'm going to read you some of the answers that were left in my Tog Knowledge community for this question. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to leave any names, I, but I'm going to read you some of the answers and then we'll pick up as to why this led to tonight's topic. This one, very legitimate. I can relate to this some days. Quite simply, getting older and stiffer. The lack of flexibility makes shooting more difficult. Okay, I can totally understand that. Another one, head trash. With quotes, head trash, right? Stuff up here. About needing to create perfect images. Allowing rules and thoughts and others' opinions to interfere with my photography and my ability to get better. Okay, I'll go along with that. Another photographer said, least favorite thing is posing people and honestly, just the lack of confidence. Another photographer, this was a rather lengthy one, so I'm going to hit pieces of it, but this photographer said the least favorite thing for him is the decision-making process and honestly, that process in general. He likes creating the photo and the process of trying to be creative and you know, try new things. But after that, the decision-making process to decide which are keepers and which are not, he doesn't like it, especially if he's taken too many good pictures, okay? When he has a large amount of pictures, he finds that the process becomes overwhelming and monotonous, especially if he thinks that too many of the pictures are keepers. Um, last, another decision, who am I doing it for? If it's for a client or a subject, I'm doing it for them, so that's a little bit easier. But then if I'm doing it for me or taking pictures for myself for fun, like birding or wildlife or landscape, well then how do I process the image? What way is the best way? Because who am I doing it for? These are actually real problems. Not what I thought would be the least favorite part of photography, but this is what led to tonight's conversation. Uh, another photographer said the business side of it, okay? Um, and then went on to quote something that I talk about all the time, but that's okay. Um, another one said, um, seeing what I want to capture from an artistic point of view and then having to deal with wearing glasses. Okay. I can understand that. Glasses take some getting used to if you've never had to wear them. And especially with a camera, my biggest problem is, and I find that happens a lot with my Sony's for some reason, the Olympus cameras didn't do this to me as much, 
But the Sony's, the way the eye cups are designed, they smudge my glasses more. So whenever I'm shooting outside the studio, I am always sure to make sure I have eyeglass wipes, loads of them in my pockets because I will have to clean my glasses from the smudge marks. Yeah, okay. Um, another person said the time spent in file transfers and culling and creating backups, least favorite part. Oh, okay. I mean, certainly most of us have more fun taking the picture, right, than we do doing the other stuff. Some of us enjoy the other stuff, but it's still more fun taking the picture. Um, another photographer, culling. Uh, but then went on to say finding subjects, okay? Um, another photographer who's here tonight in the chat thread, uh, the administrative and bookkeeping and marketing and business side of it. Um, if we're talking just the photography part, I sometimes struggle with using available light and then switching to, and then I switch to off-camera flash as my default safety net, right? And I can go on and on and on here but I wanted to share a series of those with you. There's a whole nother set on, on Facebook when I posted it there. So when I first started seeing these posts come up last week, my first gut response was, well, wait, this, these are all problems. This isn't the least favorite part. These are just problems. You're telling me your problems. And then I kind of realized like, no, wait, I misinterpreted the question. The question that I asked, I misinterpreted it. I misinterpreted what it meant to people. But that also made me realize that I spend a lot of time really stressing to all of you the need for practice, the need for simplifying things as much as possible to really build a foundational skill set because then you can do anything. Once you have the foundation, you can do anything. But right there, there's the trigger piece. Once you have the foundation, you can solve any problem. So then I started thinking, well, okay, so if the first answer to every one of these least favorites is actually a matter of learning how to solve the problem, then how does that relate in a bigger picture? And then I started thinking about photographers that I admire. I started thinking about photographers who are influencers. I started thinking about photographers who are popular today. And they all share that skill set. They are able to solve problems. And, and the reason why the answer is not something like, well, the, the most successful photographers just know more than everybody else or are just more creative because there, there is no such person. See, all of these photographers, whether it's influencers, whether it's popular photographers, whether it's iconic photographers, whether it's that photographer in your camera club that you're actually just a little bit jealous of because the work is so good. It's their ability to solve problems, meaning they have the confidence of knowing that they're willing to put in the work to solve the problem. They're willing to do the research or they're willing to make the mistakes or they're willing to experiment to solve the problem. And as a result, they're open to problems. Anything that comes their way that is an annoyance or that hits their least favorite list, they view it as an opportunity. It's a glass half full thing, literally. Like, okay, that's something that I need to work on. That's something that I need to learn more about. That's something that I have to be willing to fail at. Fail at it. Meaning I'm going to pick up the camera and I'm going to do that something. And I'm going to work through it and solve that problem until I can consistently create that way. That's the key. So downside, right? There's no shortcut to having this number one skill. You don't just get to say, I'm going to be a problem solver. I probably would not have been a problem solver. Just me, who I am, the way I'm wired, I probably would not have been that. My father, my father was a man who worked in factories. He came out of the Air Force. He went to mortician school, but wound up working in factories for the rest of his adult life. He was a very hard worker. He was the kind of man who could fix anything. He could take a car engine apart and put it back together and fix the car. He could repair something in the house. A toaster could die, and he'd figure out what part to replace and 
fix the toaster. It used to drive him nuts because I could pick up a screwdriver and never remember which way to turn the damn screwdriver. I think it took me till sometimes in my 30s before righty tighty lefty loosey really kind of stuck. I'm not kidding. I was not a problem solver by nature. He was. But he was my example. And it didn't matter what it was. He always seemed to figure out a way how to fix it. And I always thought that was pretty cool. Like I admired that trait in my dad. It's like, because everybody knew, everybody in the family, all of our friends, everybody in the neighborhood. It's like, got something broken? Give it to him. He's going to be able to figure it out. And he would. I think he actually enjoyed the challenge. He was great at problem solving. Keep in mind, this was long before you could go to YouTube to, to get any help with the answers. This was like straight up hardcore problem solving. Okay. But that's what influenced me. And then as I got further and further into photography, I didn't realize it early on, but I realized, I started to realize that a lot of what my mentors had been teaching me was problem solving. You've heard me talk before that when I would ask a question of one of my mentors, they would rarely give me an answer. Rarely. To me, it felt like it was an annoying game. But what they would do is they would ask me questions back. They would ask me questions that would lead me down the path to essentially solve my own problem. And along the way, if there was a point where they knew that I didn't have any idea what that next piece was, that would be the, come here, let me show you something moment. And then it would be back to the questions for me to figure it out. Because they understood if I figured it out, it was going to stick. I was going to understand it. Had they just shown me a YouTube video, it might have gotten me through the problem in that moment, but it wouldn't have stuck. I wouldn't have truly understood the solution. I might have known the solution and been able to do it right then and there, but that doesn't mean I'd be able to recall that and do it again later because the fact is, science says I probably would not have been able to, right? So problem solving is something that you have to commit to. So I wanna give you some examples. These, these things that I read, okay? Uh, and by the way, I see that uh, Flair Can Co. glasses smudging, not an issue from the Nikons here, thankfully. Yeah, I mean, it, my old Nikons didn't cause me problems either. Very rare occasion. Um, and it's not that it's something that Sony did weird. It's just, it's a design thing. It may be a material difference. I don't know. Uh, but yes, I find myself getting my glasses smudged much more. And so I just prepare for it. My solution to that problem is anytime I go out the door, it, like if I were to pick up my camera bag right now, if I here. Here's my small bag, and, well, they're on the inside. I have eyeglass wipes packed in the bag. So there's a whole baggie full of them, okay? And they, so the bag, where the cameras go, the bag goes, they go with me. Um, I have eyeglass wipes in my car. I will usually stick some in my pocket. Um, I am not a big fan of... The cloth eyeglass wipes, me personally, only because once I get the littlest bit of dirty, you're just like, you know, pushing oil around in your glasses. But it, it's an easy to solve problem, right? You just make sure you have eyeglass wipes. Done. That's it. So I want to go through some of the ones that I read for you a few minutes ago. And I want to talk a little bit about some potential solutions. And all of you can feel free to weigh in here on some of these solutions because crowdsourcing can be very useful when it's done right. So one of the first ones I read to you was one that we can't turn the clock back on, but quite simply, getting older and stiffer. The lack of flexibility makes shooting more difficult. Most other things can be dealt with. Okay, so what I don't know off the top of my head is I don't know what kind of photography this person is doing most of the time, et cetera. There's a lot of unknowns here. But so obviously, I'm not a spring chicken anymore either. There are days where, especially if I've had a really busy week, I got a lot of stiff joints that I'm dealing with, right? So before I go to shoot, like a half an hour before, I'm going to take some ibuprofen or maybe I'm going to take an Advil that day, number one. Number two, I am going to try to make it a point to do some basic exercising and stretching. And believe me, I hate exercise, but 
I do basic exercises almost every day. I do stretching almost every day. Joe Dusel here says, yep, yoga for the stiffness. Okay. So it's kind of one of those things that part of the reality of getting older, this has nothing to do with photography, but part of the reality of getting older, for those of you that are young, you've been warned. One of the realities of getting older is that you actually have to work harder just to stay functional because we all want to stay functional. Right? If you don't work harder at staying functional, you're not going to be functional. You're going to lose function. That's just part of getting older, period. So, you know, the answer there is doing things that are going to help you. But then there are other answers. Let's talk about the photography side of that equation, okay? One is lighter gear, right? So maybe it is a matter of switching to a system like Olympus, for instance, especially if you're doing a lot of hiking or things like that. If you need to be a full frame shooter, if, if something like you have to shoot full frame, then, then it's a matter of really putting some thought and planning into what you're about to shoot and only taking the gear that's necessary, right? Another option is looking at different variations on the gear. So for instance, you all know I shoot with Tamron gear, right? Well, Tamron makes some amazing zooms that are extreme range zooms from like 50 to three or 50 to 400 uh, or 50 to 150, or excuse me, 30 to 150. Um, you can basically create a scenario where you're taking three or four lenses and knocking it down to one lens, less gear to take, okay? Um, if you have a problem where maybe you don't have great knees, but you wanna be able to get lower camera angles or that, they have the collapsible seats for photographers now that fold up into a little disc and they're light enough. You can put it on a carabiner hook, clip it on your belt. And then when you need to use it, you take it off your belt, pop open the seat and sit down. Now, I'm not saying, look, you're not going to be a little stiff or tight getting up, but you don't have to hold yourself in that bent position. You can sit gets you the lower camera angle, right? So again, problem solving. All of it is about problem solving so that the fact of getting older and stiffer, you don't want to let it get in the way. So you look to solve problems. Uh, this is a tough one. Head trash about needing to create perfect images, allowing rules, his own thoughts and others' opinions to interfere with his photography and getting better. So I'm going to take that one backwards. Let's do the last piece. Others' opinions interfering with his photography. So how do, we have, how do we solve that problem? Well, it's easy to say to somebody, don't listen. But if people speak it or people type it, it's there, right? It, it, it's already there. You're, you're fighting against it and you're fighting to ignore it. And it's much harder after the fact. But what I don't know, I, I read you exactly what he typed. What I don't know is, are these opinions showing up on social media? Well, there's a great reason to stay off of social media right? Or at least a great reason to not read the comments. Because in all likelihood, comments about your photography are not coming from potential customers. And I don't know if this photographer is shooting professionally. I don't think this photographer is. Um, so comments about your photography are coming from other idiots with cameras who think that their opinion carries value and that they have to share their opinion. For some reason, you know, it's that whole conversation we had about being compelled to share an opinion, right? So those people are easy to eliminate, block them, delete their comments, don't read their comments, don't participate, floor can or disable, limit comments. Yes, all of those things. I admitted to you guys the other week, I finally, I got so frustrated with people having to debate Brett Weston or Ansel Adams, that their quotes are wrong? Like, really? I finally decided, okay, look, I, I can't do this. I'm spending a lot of money to do these photo quotes. So I said, you know what, that's it. If I don't like a quote, I'm not gonna stress over it. I'm gonna delete the damn thing. And if this person persists on being obnoxious and taking exception to every quote that's posted, I'm gonna block them. I don't need that stress. And at the end of the day, their obnoxious comments, they're not providing any value because they don't say that's wrong because I think this, they just are obnoxious. Like that's wrong. That's crap. You know what? They're gone. They're, 
as they say on Shark Tank, they're dead to me. And you know what? It's exhilarating to not have to put up with the bullshit. It really is. So the whole thing about others' opinions, you really don't have to deal with others' opinions, but you may have to put in some effort to avoid them, okay? Um, allowing rules, that's a tough one. It is because, you know, you may have heard me say this before, so please, just in case any of you are about to type something with, <laughs> with rules, don't type yet. Hear me out. I talk about rules a lot in the presentations that I do to camera clubs and things like that around the country. And I can pretty much guarantee anytime I say the phrase, you know, rule is a four letter word. Remember what your mama taught you. Don't use four letter words. Somebody will speak up or start typing if it's a Zoom presentation and they're going to come back with the, but you have to learn the rules to break the rules. Take photography away for a second. Let's just use the English language and, and break that down. You have to learn the rules to break the rules. So first of all, do you, do you have to know the law to break the law? No, you don't. There's a lot of laws that you can break without knowing what the hell the law is. So you have to learn the laws? Are the rules to break the rules? That, that's the most ridiculous thing ever. And here's what makes it really ridiculous. What makes it really ridiculous is your brain. Once you know the rules, you are fighting your own brain to ignore those rules, to get outside the box, and to be creative. Ignoring rules doesn't make you creative. Not knowing the rules, not thinking about the rules, not having rules, being open to new and different and unusual, that's what makes you creative. So for those of you that have been spouting that whole thing about learn the rules to break the rules, please stop. And please, like sincerely, I, I won't bully you if you'll listen and consider Please don't be that photographer that tells that to every young photographer you meet because it's the biggest bunch of crap ever. Scientifically, cognitively, it is the biggest bunch of crap ever. You don't need to know the rules. But here's the problem. This photographer knows the rules. So his challenge is the rules get in his way. And yes, there's really only one answer to that. And that is you gotta work a little harder to get past them. In fact, Maybe try what I try. You've heard me talk a lot before when I'm going to do a big presentation, like I'll be doing imaging in January in Nashville. The week before I travel to Nashville, I will have Lola, my mannequin, set up in my studio. My presentation in Nashville is going to be all about color and color theory and color gels. And we're going to do some crazy creative stuff. And even my hands-on pre-con classes are going to be all about playing with color and things like that. So I will spend about four days beforehand, looking for new interesting ideas because I know there will be some people there that have seen me talk before. I don't want to do the same damn thing. That's boring. They'd be bored. If I was them, I'd be bored. I don't want to do that. I want to come up with something new. When you've been taking pictures for 52 years, every time you pick up a camera, there's a little bit of been there, done that in your head. So finding that new, different, unique, it's a little harder. I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm just telling you, be forewarned. That's what happens, right? So to do that the way I do it, for the sake of this photographer, is I do things that I know don't work. Maybe it's mixing two different colors. Maybe it could be anything. It could be using hard light with a gel instead of a modifier. Anything. I pick something that doesn't work. At least... I've been taught that it doesn't work. Or I tried it before, whenever, and it failed miserably. So in my mind, that doesn't work. I'll take something like that, and then I'll keep experimenting with it, and tweaking it, and twisting it, and playing with it, and adjusting it, all with the goal, and this is the goal, it's not to get it to work, but it's to find a unique way 
to get it to work. So some of the things, if you've seen my videos, you see me do on a stage in a lit trade show hall where I've done light painting and painted in a portrait background in real time in front of an audience of a couple hundred people, right? So it's a commitment to find that different way to do it. That's how you get past all that rules stuff, right? I mean, that's really the, the only way to do it. And here's the perfect image. I can simplify it. You have to be willing to accept it. I'm a perfectionist by trade, by trade, by nature, okay? I am. I am OCD about details, and I am a perfectionist. But I learned a hard lesson when I was in my teens. I had an editor at a newspaper sit me down and point out to me that I wasn't nearly as good as I thought I was. At this moment, this was Joe working really hard not to just bawl his eyes out, right? And this guy tore me apart quite a bit. And then he let me leave his office. I was devastated. I was like, do I give up? What do I do? I don't know. A couple of days later, I got called back into his office. And he literally just kind of sat and looked at me and was like, so how are you feeling about things? <laughs> like literally, this was, this was old school help, right? You know, he's got a big smile on his face. Like, so how are you feeling about things? And I'm like, honestly, like crap, man. You just told me my work is horrible. And he's like, no, that's not what I told you. That's your problem. He's like, that's on you. I never said your work was horrible. He said, if you listen, I actually said your work was really damn good, but not as good as you think it was. There's a difference. And then he broke it down and he walked me through it. And he pointed out the fact that one of your problems is you're a perfectionist and you get frustrated. You get frustrated at yourself. You get frustrated at people you're working with when something's not perfect. He says, but let's, let's keep it real for a minute. Number one, Nobody gets perfect. Nobody. Number two, you're like 18 years old. What are you going to do for an encore if you get perfect? How do you top perfect? What comes next? So stop worrying about perfect. And then he stopped. He said, now, being a perfectionist, is an excellent trait as long as you don't let it defeat you, as long as you do not get upset at people you're working with, as long as you do not get upset at yourself. Being a perfectionist will drive you to do good work. It will drive you to be detail-oriented. But it's a fine line that you have to walk. And if you cross the line, it becomes the worst thing in the world. But if you work up to that line, that line of understanding, I can never achieve perfection. And it's probably a good thing if I don't. That line. As long as you work towards that line and work hard, it can be an excellent trait and one that will benefit your photography. Cross that line and it's a problem. And I've never forgotten that lecture. I've never forgotten that philosophy and that philosophy has done me quite well throughout my career. But yes, the way it was presented to me was not fun at all, okay? Uh, another one we had, posing people, and then also this photographer wanted to say lack of confidence, really. So uh, obviously, I can't get too deep into this right now, but I talk about this one all the time in a lot of my, my presentations because I want to hit a bunch of these. Posing people, don't pose. Pose, it's a four-letter word. Four-letter word. Don't use four-letter words. I have to say it's okay to use Sony now, but other than that, don't use four-letter words, right? Just don't. Okay. Um, look, I, I know all of you hear me say this all the time, but yet you all go away. Well, not all, but most of you all walk away and then you try to pose people. Okay. Or you even use that word pose, right? And you'll go watch those YouTube videos where like, here's 10 poses for guys. Here's 10 poses for women. Here's 10 poses for couples. They all suck. I don't care who made the video. They all suck. You know why? Number one, you're not the person that made the video. Number two, if you actually pay close attention to those videos, most of those photographers are doing one of two things. They're doing the Peter Hurley thing. 
schmize, hold the hoogie, right? But Peter Hurley's Peter Hurley, and he is amazing at what he does. But there is not another Peter Hurley around anywhere. The guy's 6'5", he's got big, deep, booming voice. He was an Abercrombie and Fitch model, for crying out loud. So most of us are not going to be able to pull off Peter Hurley. Plus, the overwhelming majority of Peter Hurley's portraits are of actors, people who know how to emote. That's their job. Or there's the people that will basically walk up to a person or a couple and be like, okay, you put your hand here, you put your hand there, that's good now. Lean in a little bit, good, tilt that hand. And by the time they're done, the person is like, this feels like the dumbest thing I have ever done in my freaking life. God, I hope this looks good. And the problem is, that's exactly what's on their face. Is that good? That's not good. Not at all. And look, I know you think I'm just taking pot shots at people. No, I'm not. Do your history. Do your history. Where did posing come from? Posing is so old, it was because artists needed people to hold still long enough so they could draw them. And then in the early days of photography, photographers needed people to hold still long enough so they wouldn't be a blurry mess in the picture. That's why early pictures, everybody's mouth is closed. Because if you smile, your lips are gonna start to twitch a little bit if you have to hold it that long, or your cheeks are gonna start to twitch, and then your face is blurry. And I'll take it a step further, since I know some of you are still not convinced. The next time you go to photograph a portrait of someone, and when I say portrait, it could be a casual portrait. It could be a formal portrait, like you're going to put them on a posing stool, whatever. I want you to pay close attention. And, and you're, going to do, you're going to do a little thing. It'll take you literally five seconds. But you have to remember this and you have to do it. What you're going to do is you make sure that when you pick up your camera off of table, cart, wherever your camera's sitting, you're going to pick the camera up in front of them so they can see you pick up the camera. And you need to be looking in their direction. You're going to pick up the camera. You're going to walk up to the spot where you're going to take the picture. And by the time you get your camera to here, not here, here, because you need to be able to see the person. I guarantee you, you're going to have a person sitting there like this. And by the time you get the camera here, they're going to go. Guaranteed. Why is that going to happen? That's going to happen because in grade school, all around the world, even down under where they do things the other way. In grade school, you were taught, sit up straight, smile pretty for the camera. You were encouraged, sit up straight, because your posture had to be good. Because if your posture was good, you were gonna look good in the picture. You were taught that when you were young and impressionable. So it is now a habit. And now it's an even bigger problem because if the photographer says, no, 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 you don't have to sit up straight, go ahead and relax, then you're sitting there the whole time doing this, thinking, I'm slouching, and I look like I'm slouching, and my portrait's going to be really horrible. Posing is not the answer. Body language is the answer. So now I've just given you something else you've got to learn a little bit about. You don't have to become an expert on body language. And you can actually learn quite a bit about body language on YouTube, because it's very visual. It's actually helpful, right? But Body language and emotion. Emotion drives body language, right? So when it comes to posing and those things, it's all about the emotion. What are you trying to project in the image? That's going to drive everything that you need to happen, okay? Um, let's see. So this is another one. Decision-making process um, and that process in general. So this was the person saying, you know, which ones are keepers, which ones are not, uh, if I've taken too many pictures. So let me stop there. Too many pictures. There is no such thing as too many pictures. Okay? Just not. Um, I don't agree with that concept at all. There is software. So we're solving problems. There is software now that will do culling for you. Use it. It's actually pretty doggone amazing, especially for event photographers, wedding photographers, and portrait photographers. It will find you the best expressions. It will find you straight on, head turned, all that kind of stuff. It will find that for you, okay? So get software. 
That way you don't have to do the work yourself, right? It's not going to eliminate 100% of the work, but it's going to eliminate a large chunk of it so that you're only going through a few images, right? Um, as far as the who are you doing it for, you know, if it's for yourself, how do you process it and all that, the answer is actually incredibly simple. If you're doing it for you, you do it however the hell you want to do it. And anybody that tells you otherwise, tell them to F off to their face, preferably, because then they'll never tell you again. It's not their business, right? It, it's just not. Look, at the end of the day, even when I do a review on somebody's picture, this is why I hate critiques, because a critique is just some idiot's opinion, some idiot who thinks he's amazing. When I do a critique for somebody or review for somebody, I make them tell me, if you're in my group, you know this, I make them tell me, why'd you take the shot? What were you trying to accomplish? And most of all, like, are you happy with it? And then the big question, the key, if you could go back and do it again, what would you do different? How would you change this picture? So with the answer to those four questions, that, those four little pieces of information, simple questions. Now, instead of just giving an opinion and saying, no, oh, your picture sucks. Now I can help them achieve their goal. I can take my experience and apply it to what they want to accomplish with that picture and say, okay, cool. So here's how I would approach doing that. This is what I would do. And then also what I can do, if I'm seeing something in the image that I, to me, is really noticeable, big problem, but they're not seeing it, then I can also add. And you know what? In addition to that, I really think you ought to look at this. Because I really think that if you change this, it would have a huge impact on your picture. And here's why. Not just oh, you want to change this. And those of you that know me, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person, I'll look at something and say, that sucks. But I'll never, never end a sentence there. I will go, and especially if, I, if that's the first thing that comes out of my mouth, because I don't have a lot of filters. I will go to great lengths to explain why and how you can improve it and how you can make it better and why you should care about that piece of information. Because otherwise, you're not helping. But to this person's question, problem, least liked, do what you do for you. That's it. That's, that's part of the joy and the beauty of photography. It's, it's actually this very selfish, very personal pursuit. And enjoy it. Because indeed, when you do do it for money, the rules flip upside down. And now it's not about you, it's about your client, which it should be, that's fair, but don't let yourself get caught up when you're doing your own stuff. So my point for doing this, because I realize I've pretty much taken the whole hour, my point for doing this is, look, any one of these problems, any one of these elites that photographers listed, and I know a lot of you have the same least favorite thing, they are solvable problems. You have to be willing to put in a little bit of work. Maybe you have to get a little bit of help. Maybe you have to do a little bit of research. Rarely will you have to buy a piece of gear to solve that problem. Rarely. Okay. It's usually a matter of going to be needing to learn something or implement a new system to get things done to maybe it's an organizational thing. It can be any number of things, but the key is change what you're doing. And that's the last piece. If it ain't working, if you ain't having fun, if it's whatever that's not good, change it. What is the definition of stupidity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting or hoping for a different result. Every one of these issues is solvable. Some of them not 100%. The gentleman that's getting older and stiffer, I can't make him younger, but I can certainly come up with a lot of things that will help alleviate some of the issues that he's dealing with to the point where they're stopping him from being able to take pictures. Right? So every one of these things can be dealt with. Indeed, it's always going to take a little bit of effort, but anything that's good, everything, anything that's worth having is going to take a little bit of effort. 
So I just real quick, there are a couple questions here I wanted to hit really quick because I, I promised people I do questions and now I, I didn't get them and I'm over time. Uh, Art Within, what software do you recommend for coloring? I'll be honest with you, I don't have a recommendation. Um, there are a bunch that are out there. I will promise you this, Art Within, you be here next week when I do the show and I will give you a list of some of the more popular ones that are out there right now. Because I'm not going to lie, I'm drawing a blank on it right now, but I promise you they exist. There are some good ones. I've actually seen some demoed, and I'm embarrassed to say, I honestly, I'm not remembering a single name at the moment. Come back next week. I'll have a list for you that I can share, okay? Marcus, uh, a long time ago, I talked about the myth of the lighting triangle. Uh, I reviewed those. I've never done a video uh, about it. So the lighting triangle, here, here's the problem with, with um, the, the lighting triangle, okay? Um, the short version of the answer is, it was designed and developed as a memorization technique. That's where it came from. And it was done in the film days. When ASA and ISO, because it was actually done when it was ASA, before we had ISO, right? But it was designed in the film days with ASA, and that's when ASA actually meant something. ISO doesn't mean anything today. ISO is a piece of software. It's game. Think of ISO, literally all of you. ISO is like the volume control on your stereo. It's gain. It's all it is. It's gain. Okay. And just like a stereo, if it gets too loud, it sounds like crap. It starts to blow out the speakers, right? ISO is the same exact thing, except it's for an image. But here's the problem with a memorization technique. The memorization technique doesn't teach you anything about the relationships between aperture, shutter speed, ISO. And if you change one by this much, how much do you have to change one or the others? What can you do? It doesn't teach you any of that. It just shows you the three things, and depending on which version of the exposure triangle you see, you you know get um, some little lines and arrows that if you do this, you've got to go there, right? But it's a memorization technique. So now, here's where Joe applies the science, because you know I always go back to the science, blame my wife, but she's right. Memorization happens in one side of the brain. Understanding happens in the other. The two don't connect. So... Number one, the exposure triangle is outdated and not applicable to digital technology. Number two, it's a memorization technique. So just because you can memorize the three things that are on the exposure triangle, you know, that's like a participation prize. You just want a pin, not you, Marcus, but I mean in general. It's like, okay, you deserve a pin for being able to remember something. Does that make your photography any better? No. Does it actually help you with your photography because you can remember shutter speed, aperture, and ISO? Those things are in your instruction manual. If you'd have read the damn instruction manual, you wouldn't need to remember the exposure triangle, right? Just saying. So that's the problem with the exposure triangle. It is old and it's outdated and it was honestly never effective in the first place. Believe me, I had that shoved down my throat as a kid, but it does not uh, apply today, right? So uh, that's the whole thing about the exposure triangle, okay? All right, gang. Uh, listen, I guess more than anything, thank you for listening. I didn't get you, you didn't get much talking in tonight, but it's something to think about. Seriously, it's something to think about. Uh, and it's really, honestly, this whole conversation between these two weeks, it's given me a lot to think about, even in terms of topics that we should discuss. And, and honestly, the way that I should approach some of the things that I teach, because, you know, I, I'm, and again, you've heard me talk about various pieces, but part of the challenge is the gear that we use today is amazing. It, it really is amazing. But what happens is it tends to allow us to get further into photography, almost with like this false sense of ability. And then we suddenly realize it, it's like in the cartoons, you know, like Wile E. Coyote. It's like we realize we've taken three extra steps off the cliff that we shouldn't have because we don't really know how to get any further, right? Because the camera can only take us so far. And I think it's important that we all understand, look, with a little bit of effort, every one of these things is solvable. None of these is a real obstacle. It's real in your mind. It's real because at the moment you are struggling with it. So that's very real. But it's not real in the sense that it can't be overcome and it can't be worked through. And so if nothing else, I, I would like to see it be a bigger part of the conversation. So we really focus on this problem solving concept because I'm finding too many photographers, like many of the people that answer this question, are willing to accept these obstacles and just leave them there as it's an obstacle. Nah, 
Get rid of the obstacles. Get rid of the obstacles and sky's the limit. You can do whatever you want. That's the great part about photography today and AI. If you can imagine it, you can create it. And that's really cool. So listen, in the United States, have an incredible Thanksgiving. Get some rest. Don't spend too much money on Black Friday. Around the rest of the world, have a great Thursday, Friday, Saturday, etc. I'll see you all next week. If you're in my Todd Knowledge community, our community meetup is Friday night this week. So we will still have one. Just going to be a day later. Adios, gang. Take care.